Hi all. Yes, I have. You're all, you're all good. Beautiful day. Okay, you guys right to go? Today I will again visit Government House and resign as Premier and member for Mulgrave, effective 5pm tomorrow. It's not an easy decision because as much as we've achieved... From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. It's Wednesday, September 27. Yesterday, Daniel Andrews announced his resignation as the Victorian Premier. I've never complained about the fact that we had to deal with fire and flood and a one in 100 year pandemic. That's the job. This was a snap declaration made in a press conference outside the Victorian State Parliament and was organised only 40 minutes beforehand. To a certain extent, every wakey moment is about the work and that takes a toll. First, we speak to state political editor Annika Smethurst about why he's resigned, why now and what it means for Victoria. Then we'll air an episode recorded late last year, just ahead of the Victorian state election. In that episode, state political reporter Rachel Eddy interviewed her colleague and journalist Sumeya Illenby, author of a revealing biography of Daniel Andrews. It explored how he became the most divisive premier in the country. So, Annika, you've just come out of the press conference where Daniel Andrews announced his resignation as Victorian Premier. Tell me about that. It was somewhat unexpected, but also quite expected. I was at lunch with somebody and I know a lot of other journos are out and about across town doing what journos do, nattering to people. So it was a bit of a surprise in terms of that. His staff were only told moments before, which we always thought this would be the case. You know, before the election last year, Daniel Andrews said he was going to do a full four years, but... I'm really not sure who expected that. You know, leading a state or any political career these days to be at the top for 12 years is quite an incredible feat. So we knew we'd probably go midterm, but, you know, this week of Grand Final Week in Victoria, nothing usually happens around this time and around Melbourne Cup Day. So I know um, I wasn't quite expecting it. But I think, you know, when you look at his legacy and, and, you know, his reflections today, I think he just had enough. I'd sort of picked up on it. I started my career at state politics when he was first elected and um, when he was opposition leader. And I had noticed that he he didn't seem to have the same joy for the job, I guess. And any job gets you down after a while, let alone leading through what he did. So he made the point that he didn't want to resent the job, didn't want to dislike it, didn't want people to be calling for him to go. So he thought now was the right time. And what about the reaction and what he actually said at the press conference? He sort of implied that he'd put his thoughts together last night and only decided this in a few days, but I'm sure he'd been thinking about this for many years. He wasn't too emotional. You know, I think he knows this has been coming for a while. His wife, Kath, uh, and two of his children were there. Um, There could have been a third. I didn't see one. I don't think she was there, but his two sons were there. You know, he thanked his staff, people that have served alongside him for many years. One of the criticisms of him has been how centralised power has been under him, and that includes staff, and not necessarily the best cabinet process that he really has been that strong strong leader so the people who love him and worked alongside with him they do adore him and they have been part of his team and it is sort of an incredible environment they've created many would be critical of it but in terms of leadership and getting things done it's proved very effective and he named a lot of those people today he's achieved all that he can achieve in this day and age, lead for as long as he had, uh, boost the number of seats at the last election after those COVID years. He also had that back injury, you might remember. So it's rather incredible that uh, he's managed to do what he's done. And I think, you know, I would watching him, he's a man that really his time is up and he knows it and he wants to go and do something else. I will be forever grateful for the honour of leading this very special place. I'm now happy to take a few of your questions. What's the mood in Melbourne and Victoria more broadly at the moment? Do you think that with Dan Andrews' resignation, there'll be lots of people cheering, given how so many people suffered during those COVID lockdowns? It's funny, he walked out of the back of Parliament House and I was walking just behind him and there was cheers from people who had just heard it. So he actually does remain 
you know, relatively popular among some people. I think a lot of his sort of people that don't like him actually aren't Victorians. That having said that, I was just listening to a bit of talk back. He is a polarising figure. So I don't think central Melbourne, uh, where I'm standing right now, is perhaps the best reflection of how people will remember him. Um, you know, he has picked a happy week. It's AFL Grand Final Week. Everybody's feeling good. We've got a public holiday on Friday. So I don't know if that played into it. But look, We've just noticed some of the decisions the government have taken, financial decisions, sort of having a real world impact, whether that be the Commonwealth Games and, um, you know, having to cancel those. So I think it was a turning point in the next few years. People might have a bit of a different view about the government, just mainly because of how much, uh, how they've struggled, I guess, to uh, balance the books. But, uh, you know, maybe he got out at the right time. I'd say that's probably what I'm taking out of this. Okay, and Andrews has said that the next premier would be chosen by caucus and that he won't have a vote. So who's in the running and when are we likely to know? Look, this is all unfolding now and even those questions about will he have a vote, will it be decided this week are still up for grabs. There is, I guess, a natural successor, which is Jacinta Allen. She's the member for Bendigo. She was elected in her 20s in 1999. She has held major portfolios. She's currently his deputy. She's from the same faction as he is, and that faction uh, is quite dominant uh, in Victorian politics. Uh, I guess it just depends if the right say, no, we don't want to be um, hoodwinked by this or taken you know, for granted here. We want to put up a candidate too and see how much support they can get. Um, often Labor, these things are sort of hashed out in the sidelines. There is talk in this early stage that the right is considering a tilt. There is also talk that 48 hours isn't enough. They'd like it to be pushed out a little bit longer, I guess, to try and build their numbers. But you'd have to say Jacinta Allen is uh, the most likely candidate at the moment. Okay. And we know that Daniel Andrews is Labor's longest serving premier in the state. So do you have any thoughts about what impact this resignation could possibly have on Labor federally? Look, I don't know about federally, but just talking about his legacy as a Labor leader, you know, we've had a churn in Canberra of politicians in recent years. He would have to be, if you look across Australia, one of the biggest political figures of our time well, in Labor, but even across the board, just because of the time he's been there. A picture came up in my phone recently, a memory of when I first started as a journalist in Canberra. Tony Abbott was Prime Minister. Mike Baird was the New South Wales leader. And Dan Andrews was there, you know, and there has been this churn through other states and, and federally, and he has just been this sort of long-serving figure in the Australian political landscape. And I think COVID obviously put him, I guess, on an even bigger pedestal than he was already on. I think he was very much key to Labor's success down here. Now, they do have a huge majority, and I'm not saying by losing him that all of a sudden that goes, but I think it does tighten up a bit. He was very polarising, and I think more so out of Victoria than in Victoria. His polling numbers have actually been relatively strong down here. I do think that will tighten. I do wonder how anybody goes, you know, without him because he has been there for so long. In terms of federally, look, I think it's a different ballgame. He he really didn't involve himself too much in the federal election. He's a good friend of Anthony Albanese's, but they've really maintained a separate thing. He has really become known as, you know, Victoria's guy. He, he doesn't sort of meddle too much in the federal sphere, so I don't think it'll have too much of an impact on next year's a federal election. Annika, thank you so much. No worries. Now, here's state political reporter Rachel Eddy interviewing Sumeya Illenby on who Dan Andrews is and his path to prominence. Sumeya, you spent months writing a biography about the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews, published just recently. What made you want to spend all of this time thinking and writing about him? Why is he worthy of a book? So I was approached by the publishers around this time last year, actually, and it was an incredibly challenging four-month writing process because normally with these projects, you obviously get a bit of access to, to the person that you're writing about, to, you know, the person who you're writing a biography of. I didn't have any access to the premiere, and I think that's quite telling of the kind of person he is. However, he is a really important person to be documenting, a really worthwhile project to be working on, given he has been one of Labor's longest serving leaders over the last couple of decades. He's really transformed Victoria over the past eight years since he's been Premier. He managed the rare feat of toppling a one-term Liberal government and he's on the cusp of managing another rare feat of a third-term Labor government. 
And we saw particularly during the pandemic how polarising he became, how divisive he became, um, but also the national prominence that he received as well. And his leadership style, which was in contrast to the Prime Minister at the time, Scott Morrison, and the way that he was really able to command the attention of the state and the country. And before we get into the pandemic, I want to discuss how Daniel Andrews got into politics in the first place. He's the sixth longest serving Premier and he's likely to win a rare third term. So what was his path to get here? So he was born in the 70s and obviously that time was a period of quite a big social and economic upheaval in Australia. May I ask you one simple question? Your main and only reason for coming today? Uh, to protest with the rest of Melbourne for here. It was obviously the post-Vietnam War. Now what are you protesting about? I'm protesting about the war, as it is at present. It was around the time Gough Whitlam got elected as well. Our program has three great aims. To promote equality. And uh, both his parents were your typical middle-class suburban family. And to liberate the talents and uplift the horizons of the Australian people. His mum was a bank teller and his dad owned a little, I guess it's like a milk bar or a corner shop in Glenroy. One night, the store next door to his dad's milk bar got burnt, uh, presumably and possibly in an arson attack. And in that process, the family's business essentially blew up. There was no insurance. The family had nothing essentially to fall back on. And this small family business that his father had created and his father essentially had worked so hard to build disintegrated in a matter of hours overnight. And Daniel Andrews has spoken about this quite often, about how desperate his family was during that period. They desperately needed the government to help out, to give, I guess, a lending hand, and they were unable to get that. The family packed up, moved to Wangaratta. And I guess it was this this story of his dad having lost everything in Melbourne, moved his family to rural Victoria, had to start afresh and built another small business from scratch. There is one person who is not here tonight and the seeds of this victory are in something he said to me many times when I was a much younger person. And we see Daniel Andrews today, he's very focused, he's very determined, he's everyone comments on his work ethic and how he's able to really put his mind to something and follow through with it, no matter the cost. He said to me, often, indeed always, say what you do and do what you say. And so how did he actually get into politics? He had a very typical ALP MP past in that he went to Monash University, studied um, studied an arts degree. He got involved in Young Labor and he got involved in the socialist left faction of the of the Labor Party as well. And then he became a electorate officer to Alan Griffin, the federal MP. And then within a few years, he was elected as the ALP's assistant secretary for the Victorian branch got pre-selected for the seat of Mulgrave. And by the time he was 30, he had got into Parliament. Within a couple of years after that, he was Parliamentary Secretary to Health. Within a few years after that, he was Health Minister. So it was this typical rise through the ALP backroom and then through the ALP parliamentary ranks as well. And in 2014, he's running for Premier. At that point, Daniel Andrews required a bit of a rebrand, didn't he? Can you tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. Before the 2014 election, he was he was dorky Dan. He had these really baggy, ill-fitting suits. He had this horrible haircut, horrible for even the 2014s. He had these weird-looking glasses. He was just very frumpy. He looked very nerdy. He didn't look very Premier-like or very statesman. Um, he went through that makeover in late 2013, early 2014. Growing up in Wangaratta, my parents taught me a lot of things that still guide me today. One thing they taught me was the And you see how he physically transformed. His suits became a lot better fitting. He started wearing nicer glasses. His haircut became much better. The other important thing they taught me was to always stand up for the things you believe in. And these are the lessons that Kath and I are teaching our three kids. 
We want and obviously that sort of really jays you up as well, I guess. Um, and you saw how he transformed from Dorky Dan to Dapper Dan. That's why I'm determined that an Andrews Labor government will be all about putting people first. And then with, you know, these roles, you tend to grow into them. And we've seen how he's grown into it over the last eight years. And the public was exposed to the Premier in a way we never had before in the last couple of years when he really rose to prominence throughout the pandemic. Can you tell me a little bit about that time and what we learned about Daniel Andrews through the course of it? I think we saw at the start of the pandemic how he really took control. He was really assertive. He really understood the severity of the situation. And I think when Victorians looked at him, they realised that he was a Premier who was willing to take control. He established a tiny crisis council of cabinet in which he had a few key ministers making all of the decisions essentially. He really got the government to focus solely and completely on the pandemic and you saw how case numbers started to come down and then we seemingly eliminated COVID and you had this relief wash over people not just in Victoria but across the country that we weren't experiencing the scenes that we saw across the globe. A few weeks after that, though, you saw those case numbers trickling back up again. Less than a dozen coronavirus cases have been recorded in Victoria in the past 24 hours. And then you had 10 postcodes going to lockdown. People in 10 Victorian postcodes are about to go into lockdown for four weeks. And then you had Premier Daniel Andrews come out and announce the immediate hard lockdown of public housing towers. Nine public housing towers in those postcodes will be the subject of a complete lockdown. We saw Andrews every single day. Very good. Thanks for joining us for the daily update. We have... For hours on end, you know, up to two hours, two and a half hours at times. 177 new cases since we last updated. Of him standing up at those press conferences, explaining what the numbers were, the epidemiological situation. Any other issues? If not, thank you all very much and we will see you tomorrow. And one of the things that you see with the Premier, with the Victorian Premier, is that he's very single-minded. You're either with him and on the right side of history or you're against him and you're on the wrong side of history. And we saw how that really played out during the pandemic where you were with him and you were trying to save the lives of the vulnerable and the elderly, or you're against him and you were questioning why Victoria had to be so hardline, why Victoria's hotel quarantine system failed in 2020 when other states hadn't, why he was not able to answer some of those really important and pertinent questions during 2020 about the failures of the the bureaucracy and the system. And it was you're against him, you don't want to save the lives of vulnerable Victorians and you're mm. only meddling. And you, you people, I think, saw for the first time how single-minded he could be. And one of the other things that I guess the pandemic really highlighted was just how he's determined to do things no matter the cost. And you were going to many of these press conferences at the time, Samaya, probing the Premier about the COVID response. What was your back and forth with the Premier like? Uh, Many back and forths, um, as you can imagine. And I think one of the reasons for that is because these press conferences went on for so long. And when the Premier tends to give an answer, he tends to waffle for a long period of time. So I think there were elements of journalists, not just myself, but other journalists trying to stop him from going off on a tangent and bring him back to the substance of the question. But what I'm saying, Samara, is I'm not going to... I'm not going... Well, the fact... My, my judgment on that matter uh, is... So you saw a lot of, you know, Samaya. Samaya, that, uh, given that that matter, as you say... Or well, her role in well, the hotel. Samaya, uh, the minister's resigned. I've indicated... Or you. me interfering and trying to say, well, Premier, no, this is the substance of my question. Oh, I'm not going Victoria. to be getting into that sort of commentary, Samaya. If you want to draw that conclusion, then that's that's a matter for you. Is but I'm, I don't believe... I don't, to draw, then? Sorry? Is that a correct conclusion to draw? I'm 
indicating to you that if you want to draw conclusions, then you can make judgments about whether they're correct or otherwise. I'm not going to be. So there was a lot of back and forth between um, the Premier and the journalists, and I think there is this thing of not trusting the media or not necessarily really appreciating the role of the media and the role of journalists and just thinking, well, he doesn't need them. And talk to me about just how divisive Daniel Andrews' handling of the pandemic was during that period, because it really seemed to fracture the state at the time. You had essentially two camps, those who were the um, the I stand with Dan crew and those who were the dictator Dan crew, those who thought Daniel Andrews could do no wrong and everything he was doing was perfect and there was no other alternative and no other option. And then you had the dictator Dan crew who thought everything Daniel Andrews is doing is wrong. He's on purpose dragging the state through this and he's not actually pursuing another viable, more viable alternative. So you had these two really divided communities and we saw it play out particularly on social media as well and I guess everybody sort of locked down in their homes and the only thing they had to do then was go on social media. So you had this very fractured society and this very fractured community. You also had people, for example, who hadn't lost their jobs. So they were comfortable, relatively comfortable with being locked down, having to, you know, either homeschool their kids who are capable of being homeschooled. And then you had another group in society who had either lost their jobs or they had their own mental health battles and they had kids with mental health issues um, and they were unable to manage in lockdown. And you saw, I guess, how that particular fracturing of the Victorian community really um, captured, I guess, the nation's attention as well. And a lot of people who think about Victoria and COVID and lockdowns just think of particularly 2020 and the divisiveness. And how has that divisiveness played out in the current election campaign? Both parties seem to be using Andrew's face, thinking it's going to help them. Who do you think that will work for? I think it is a bit of 50-50. There is clearly an anti-Dan sentiment that the Labor Party is also picking up because they believe they'll lose a couple of seats. The Liberals think it'll work for them because there was there were huge swings against the Federal Labor Party at the May federal election that the Liberals have attributed to an anti-Dan sentiment. It's hard to sort of tell, particularly right now. I'm sure after the election, in hindsight, we'll be able to say, oh, yeah, and I absolutely (laughs) predicted that. And the Liberals will say, yeah, we got it right. And if, you know, it works in Labor's favour, they'll say they got it right. Both parties are picking up an anti-Dan sentiment, but Labor has such a huge buffer here in Victoria that the Labor Party isn't thinking it'll fall, it'll lose the election. And I think pollsters, um, you know, strategists on both sides and, you know, people who observe politics all the time say the most likely outcome is a Labor government, albeit with a reduced majority. The second likely outcome is a Labor minority government with maybe some deals and negotiations with the Greens, even though the Premier insisted again on Tuesday that there would be no deals entered into with the Greens. And the very, very, very outside chance is a Liberal government. So I think a lot of people are expecting Labor to be returned on November 26. And I think one of the other things that Labor people have sort of hypothesised or that they're expecting is Daniel Andrews hangs around for a year or two and then he hands over the reins to, he would like to hand it over to Jacinta Allen. Mm. Um, It's unclear whether or not she has the support of her caucus colleagues to become the next leader. Although I should add that Andrews was asked about this a couple of weeks ago and he emphatically said that he would be leading Labor until 2026, serving out his full four years. All the way to the next election. All the way to the next election. So there are obviously these really strong opposing perceptions of Andrews. He's both revered and demonised. Samaya, I'm wondering, through the course of writing your biography, you were thinking about him for almost four months. What did you learn about him? And were you able to sort of square those public perceptions with reality? 
people are very complex, they're three-dimensional, and I did go into the writing process not thinking he was this completely flattened 2D character. I spoke to about 70 people for the book, so I feel like I do have a pretty well-rounded 360 view of, um, of Andrews. And I think... You can both be a hard-headed politician who's pushing on, pushing through, doing things no matter what the cost, as well as being empathetic, being really tuned into, you know, the plight of vulnerable people or the plight of people who are disadvantaged. I don't think one negates the other. And I think one of Andrew's strongest features is that he's able to really combine that hard-headedness with his socially progressive reform agenda. And what that means is that he's able to, um, you know, continue looking after those workers in the outer suburbs by providing them with this constant stream of construction jobs, but also being in tune to the plight of more vulnerable Victorians. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Julia Carcatzel, with technical assistance by Chi Wong. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening.